This is the Forbes Books Podcast, conversations with amazing humans who are impacting the world of business and beyond. Hola, I'm Joe Partavilla, and over the course of my career, I've been lucky enough to interview hundreds of thousands of people. I, I, I don't even want to even attempt to count. So a lot of them seem to run together, but today's guest actually doesn't, because I remember speaking to Ryan Serhant almost 20 years ago, and the only reason I remember him is because he walked to our studio. Now, mind you, I was working in radio in New York City, and most people took town cars or limousines to get interviewed in midtown Manhattan. But no, not Ryan. He was living just a few blocks away, strolled into our studio, and talked about what he was up to. At the time, it was the Bravo hit reality show, Million Dollar Listing. Well, since then, he's come a long way as a CEO, founder, and the number one residential real estate broker in New York. Today, we're going to dig into the world of branding and entrepreneurship and talk about his latest book, Brand It Like Sirhant, Stand Out from the Crowd, Build Your Following, and Earn More Money. Ryan, welcome to the podcast. How are you? I'm great, man. Thanks for being here. Thanks for seeing me. Thanks for catching up. Uh, known you a long time. It's been a long time, but uh, you know, we, we, we flow in different circles now because I first knew you when you lived at a tiny little apartment in Koreatown, but you moved on up like the Jeffersons. Uh, reality fame, built a business, writing books. Give me a snapshot of, say, the last 20 years from wh where I met you when you were you were selling like a bit like apartment high rise apartments and stuff like that to to where you are now. How how big of a jump have you taken, Ryan? Uh, well, 20 years ago, I was in high school. Well, so, all right. Maybe um, that's 20 years ago. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know, probably when I met you was kind of in the, the early 2000, like 10, somewhere in that range. You know, I moved to New York City to do theater. Uh, that didn't work out, ran out of money, got my real estate license to pay my rent. And then I just did that all day long, every day. Um, uh, eventually kind of taught myself how to sell, uh, taught myself how to build a business, taught myself how to be my own CEO, CFO, and COO. Realized that being in sales, whether you're in New York City or any other city on earth, basically means you are a solopreneur and you get to do whatever you want all day long, every day to build a business, as long as you're a good person and you work your butt off. And so I built a, a big sales team, 65 people, got myself onto a TV show called Million Dollar Listing New York, did three spinoff shows, got two Emmy nominations over the course of 10 years. COVID hits. I'm like, I'm going to start my own company now. Everyone else is freaking out and watching Tiger King. Good. Because when they're not paying attention, I'm going <laughs> to be working. And guess what? Office space in New York City right now, super cheap. Right, the SWAT, the doormen were replaced by SWAT. It was insane, <laughs> and so we started our. Uh, uh, we started that. I started my own company um, in early 2020, and uh, it's been off to the races ever since. I'm married. I have a five year old now. She turns five this month, and uh, we have a new TV show that comes out on Netflix that we just announced yesterday. My third book dropped yesterday. We've got an education business, a production company, and the brokerage business, and. That's a, that's a, that's all I can remember right now. Wow, I will tell you that was quite an impressive inside the book cover uh, recap of the last decade. Trying to go as fast as I possibly could for you. You did great, man. A gold star effort. And so I, I want to pick the thread on being an actor and being an entrepreneur because uh, you know I, I have a lot of friends in show business actors, and to me, I feel like the actor life is the ultimate entrepreneur life. Like you are literally your own champion. No one is going to care more about your career than you do. Um, yep. How do you think that sort of chemistry in your brain translated into becoming an entrepreneur and, and becoming you know a, a brand builder, a company builder, author, TV star? Tell me about that connection. An entrepreneur and an, and an actor are, are, are the same in that you can have an amazing set of skills. Right? You can have a talent for whatever it is that you do, but it doesn't matter if no one buys it. So you're either able to sell yourself on stage or in front of a casting director and be casted and actually make money so that you can actually afford to be an actor or as an entrepreneur, you're, you're selling the software you created or the idea you have or your ability to execute on, on your writing abilities, whatever it might be, or your selling abilities, but it's all a sell. You're, you're always, everyone's selling right all the time. And what I, what I didn't realize is, you know, and, 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 you know, if it were up to my parents, I never would have done this because they would have told me to just focus on math and science and history. 
But, you know, from when I was four years old up until, you know, two years after college, my main focus was, was acting, was theater, was, you know, I was, I was doing Shakespeare in the round at the Globe in London. I was doing regional theater around the country. I was doing, you know, I was on a soap opera for a while. I was doing, you know, that was like, that's, that, that's what my passion was. And I, and I got into it because I wasn't good at playing football. Like I, wow. you know, I wasn't, I wasn't a great athlete. Um, uh, and so I liked, I liked that, but what I learned when I got out of that, because I had to make money or I had to move home, right? It was like, stay in New York and make money or move home forever. Was that the acting skill, that improv skill, that ability to put on your costume and be awesome right now, even if you don't feel it, that is sales. Your ability to say yes and and move the ball forward to pick up conversations with strangers to 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 do uh, to memorize information right um uh is all the same skill it's all a it, it's it, it's an authentic performance which is why reality tv probably comes so naturally to me and so like there is an amazing synergy there like when i first started selling real estate and i first started having people work for me and i would see how they would talk to strangers like go 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 find, go give them a compliment and find something in common. That's like an improv game it's called the two C's. That's what you do. And just, and they, they, people would have no idea. So I started taking groups of salespeople and I started having them take improv classes. They just take an improv class. You have to be comfortable being a dog on Mars on fire in front of 15 other people. And you have to be careful. You have to be comfortable screaming. If you can do that and be that uncomfortable, you can go up and talk to grandma and like give her a compliment on her purse and ask her if she needs a new home. Like it's not, it's not the worst thing in the world. No one's going to punch you. And if they do, good thing you didn't work with them anyway. And now you have a good core memory story to tell. Why not? So it's all, I mean, you, you hit the nail on the head. It is all the same muscle. Um, uh, and I think, you know, you know, our, my, my, my new book brand it like Surian is, is, is all, and I re- I wrote it. I spent so much time putting it together because I, I, I honestly believe that building brand is the new higher education. Like your ability to build personal brand or product brand, given the tools and resources that are at our fingertips today, um, is is an amazing opportunity that our parents never had, right? And honestly, in ten years from now, might be almost just as hard because there's going to be so much noise, so much attention, and how do you? How do you cut through the noise when a two-year-old can be a superstar? You know, like it's, it's hard. That's hard. Um, uh, but the tools and resources are there now to create success that begets success over and over and over. That's awesome. Now, I get the performative side of sales as someone who's dabbled in improv and acting and stuff like that. But my problem is the money part. I have an irrational relationship with money. Like I, I, I could never become a salesperson because I could not take money out of people's wallets for something I'm selling. I, it's just, it's not in my DNA. I cannot do it. Where did that come from for you? Because as an actor, we all know when you're starting, it's you're, you're scrounging for money. You're struggling. For, you're not, you're not worried about uh, procuring as much money as possible. You're just looking to survive. So tell me about how this ability to, again, to be crude about it, remove money from people's wallets for something you are selling. Tell me about your relationship with money. First of all, I think the only group that ever takes your money or creates new money um, is the government. They're the, we, at the end of the day, we all work for the government. We are just employees of the government in whatever country you live in, definitely in the United States. Um, uh, you know, freedom isn't free that way. So I, I'm, I'm a pretty firm believer that I'm never taking anyone's money. It's, it's a transfer of assets. That just moves from this person and this entity to this person and this entity and just moving left and right. Right. In as much as being paid for services, in the words of the Joker in the Dark Knight, when you're good at something, never do it for free. And someone once told me, uh, why not me? Meaning, if you're gonna go buy a home and you're gonna spend the money anyway, why not do it with me and I'll help you? And I'm not taking your money. I'm actually not selling you anything. I'm actually, I'm actually helping you make a decision that you're going to make anyway. And hopefully with my professionalism and 15 years of, of, of industry knowledge, 
I'm going to be able to give you the right tools and resources needed to make a better decision and hopefully do it with less money. And if you're going to compensate me for that, you don't even have to compensate me by the hour. You know, like salespeople, I think are far less money hungry than say people who charge by the hour, you know, who are charging by no matter what they do, whether the work is good or bad, you get paid whether you're wrong or whether you're right. Um, in my business, we only, as a salesperson, you only, you only get paid when you're right. <laughs> you only get paid if your client succeeds. If they succeed, then hopefully they compensate you. But like, you know, they they don't have to, in which case, like, oh, that's a pain in the ass. Um, uh, or, or, you know, salaried employees, like, you know, you, 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 you want to get paid what you think you're worth instead of what you actually deserve. Like that for me is hard to comprehend as somebody who now has salaried employees and a lot of them, you know, I know none of them by name. I only know them by payroll. That's funny. Um, so you did a great job, by the way, of recapping your previous life and how you got here. But I want to just step back one more time about that and talk about that jump you made from, hey, I want to get a real estate license to then becoming a very successful one that's so good and handsome and a good performer that ends up on a reality show and multiple reality shows. What do you think it took for you to make that jump? Because as we all know, there's a lot of real estate in New York City and there's a lot of real estate agents in, in New York City. So why were you able to make that jump as the little guy to becoming the big guy to now becoming the guy that has employees that you all you know about is their social security number, you don't know their names? I know most of their names. Okay, okay. Um, I know most of their names. I would say if you if you go and ask any of the casting directors that have ever cast me, um, uh, I, I think they'll all say that there's somewhat of an, of an enigma around me when I walk into a room where they don't actually understand what's going on. So like part of me, like, all right, yeah, I could see that that guy was on a soap opera for a while. And the other part of me, they're like, is his, how old is that guy? Why is his hair so gray? I don't understand. How come he won't dye it? And in their part, it's like, he's so weird and quirky. I don't get, like, something isn't making sense here. All right, I guess we'll keep watching him for an extra, see, see what he does. See if he surprises us. Um, and I also think, dude, I'm, I am one, I am, I am relentless. I will follow up with you until you buy or die. Um, uh, whether it's getting me onto a reality TV show or getting you to go on a date with me or, uh, which I don't do anymore because now I'm married or, um, uh, uh, you know, or getting you to, to buy a condo. Like, you know, I, I, I've, I've sold apartments to people that had, didn't respond to me for five years. It's okay. No problem. Follow up is free. So I'll just follow up until you tell me not to, I will follow up for forever. And I, you know, when I went to the first casting for Millionaire Our Listing New York, dude, I showed up with 3,000 real estate agents at the Hudson Hotel in Times Square. 3,000 over the course, I guess it was like over the course of three days and everyone got 30 seconds in front of the camera. Um, and I just went in there. I was like, I got nothing to lose. They were like, well, why should you be on the show? Because like, I'm, I'm the greatest real estate agent in the world. And I've been doing it for 10 minutes. Like, are you really like, by the time you make this show, I will be because I know how long this stuff takes and it's going to take forever. You give me an opportunity here. I will become the greatest real estate agent on, in, on, on earth. Wow. You know? Um, wait, so, gotta... so step back a second. How long were you a real estate agent before you went on the casting call? Approximately how long were you in, like professionally doing it? A year. I, and while full time at, at, at that point, it'd only been a couple months. Because my first year in the business, which was September 2008 to September 2009, um, I, I got my real estate license as a side hustle to pay rent. I thought if I could rent an apartment and make $2,000 a month, like that's, I, I could survive, right? Because my rent was 1100 bucks and 900 bucks to survive. Um, I'll deal with taxes later. So that, that, that was really the goal. And I, was, I made more money my first year in real estate uh, hand modeling, holding phones for AT&T than I did doing real estate like you know because AT&T paid me 150 bucks an hour to hold hold a phone I made nine thousand dollars for a whole year doing real estate real estate in New York City especially starting the day Lehman Brothers files for bankruptcy um was really 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 hard like try selling something to somebody that they don't want and they can't afford and oh my god they just lost their job 
like that was that was tough, especially even on the rental side, everything. And so I think it was just I think it was just relentless. And I think I also, you know, it's like it's like anything. Like the the minute you you stop caring is when everything starts to work out, right? It's like that. Uh, uh, have you ever seen that movie with Matthew McConaughey and Michael Douglas, The Ghost of Girlfriends Past? Sure, yeah. So at the end of that movie, Michael Douglas shows up as like his, you know, I don't know, whatever that ghost was. Yeah. Um, and he tells him as far and as far as like love goes and dating, the one in the relationship who holds all the power is the one who cares the least. And there has never been a truer negotiating uh, statement ever made. Because like when I was in New York City trying to be an actor all day, every day, two years without a break auditions, headshots out, meeting people, acting like everything, everything, everything. It's really, really, really hard. The minute I'm like, fuck this, I'm going to go be a real estate agent and just make money. I don't want to do this anymore. It's just so hard. It's depressing. And then obviously what happens? Because then I, then I stop trying, Like you relax, you relax. Cause that, that, that desperation is no longer in your pores. You don't need it. It's like when they say, you know, when you're, you're on dating apps all day, you're, when you're looking for love, you're never going to find it. Right, the minute you meet all the apps, you meet the love of your life the next day because you're actually then relaxed and open to it. Um, and I think that's true. True in sales. True in entrepreneurship. True in true in acting. True in anything. Right? People want to be with people who are so confident they just don't care. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, and I always like to talk about the power of one, and it's like that one thing that happened to break you through. Like you know, for Tom Cruise, it was risky business. Uh, for Ricky Martin, it was living La Vida Loca. These are just random things that made people stars. But like, what was the one sale that you were like, this is my one. This is the one that tells me and tells the world that I'm the shit. I'm really good at this. What, was there one that stood out to you? I would say there's been two separated by about 10 years. Right. If I look at like, I, I kind of look at my life and kind of career in terms of like decades, right? Like I have my, like I'm in like phase three of my life right now. I kind of like started decade, decade, you know, three in terms of my career. The first decade, I took an apartment at 45 West 67th Street in New York City, apartment 15 ABC. Um, it had started on the market at like 15 million. It was never worth that. Four brokers had the listing. No one could sell it. It was the Great Recession. It was brutal. The seller was so stressed out. They needed to move it. Broker number five comes through. She wouldn't lower the price anymore. At that point, it was like 8.5. Everyone was saying it's actually worth like five or six million dollars. And so obviously, like I'm nobody. I'm not an agent. Like no one knows who I am. I've never sold anything over a million dollars. Somehow I got that meeting. I pitched her. She said, I think she was just like out of desperation, like, fine, let's see if this kid can sell this place. I went through every major broker in the city. Let's see if this kid can do it. Um, and I sold it for 8.3. Um, and it was in the press, everything, and it was like, huh, okay. If I can sell something other people can't. And that was, that was whether people cared about it or not, it was a, it was a, it was a big pick me up for me. Um, uh, because I was, you know, only a couple years into the business and I know that was, a, that was a big sale. Fast forward, I start my own company in 2020. It's the middle of the pandemic now. So I got into this business the day Lehman Brothers files for bankruptcy, great recession. I build up a career and then I'm like, I'm going to go start my own company. And then the next day people start getting sick in China and the world shuts down. I'm like, what do I do? Um, uh, uh, and so then I, I have to like, so then I, anyway, so I start the company. I'm just like, all right, I've got bills now. I've got payroll now. I got to figure things out now. Um, uh, it would be awesome if I could just do like one big deal, you know, and just like put that out there. Like I started my own company and I still got it because everyone's going to count me out. Um, uh, and I meet this guy who's a renter. He wants to rent something on the Upper East Side. I like, guess, yeah, great. I guess I do rentals. Um, you're in the big uh, time I, now, Ryan. You do back to rentals. Yeah, I know. Do back to rentals. I'll do anything now. Back to the circuit. And I'm talking to him. And I, I Google him. And I'm like, wow, this guy's crushing life. Um, uh, uh, I'm like, what are you renting a place? And you're like, dude, it's COVID. You know, it's COVID. I'm like, no one's here. The city shut down. He's like, well, I want to do this. I want to do that. Long story short, start talking to him. I'm like, you should, you should buy something in the city. The city's 50% off. We had just sold a place that was listed for 36 million. We sold it for 16. So the city is moving at 50% off right now because everyone's convinced we're an Armageddon. And even though we weren't, that's what the New York Times said. And so uh, and he's like, well, I don't know. I don't know what kind of where I'm being. I'm like, what about Florida? 
as I'm continuing to try to keep the conversation going, he's like, yeah, maybe send me some stuff in Florida. So I sent him some listings to buy in Florida. This is like the end of 2020. We just started. Go back and forth and back and forth. Um, and she's like, hey, yeah, let, let's go down and see some places for, for sale. Let's just let's just go and see for fun. All right. So where do you want to go? It's like, let's look at Palm Beach. Great. Never been to Palm Beach. Let's go. Um, uh, he's like, you can do Palm Beach? I guess I can. No problem. I'll make it happen. Uh, he's like, let's go tomorrow. I'm like, fuck, tomorrow? Great. I'll figure it out. So the first house I take him to, I had, uh, uh, I, cause I had time, you know, because all these showings are so spread out. These houses are big. I take him to a house and it's asking $140 million. And I take him to that house and it was totally insane. And he comes up to me and he grabs my lapel, my shirt. And he's like, why did you bring me here? And I was like, this is the moment I'm going to die. This is one of those moments. I just made the biggest mistake ever. He's like, because I want it. And by the next day, he had bought it. And it was the biggest deal I'd ever done. Nine-figure deal. It was the second most expensive home ever sold in the United States. Paid wow. just under $140 million in one day. And I met him as a renter. And so that closing was like, all right, we've kicked off decade number two. If I could start my own company and just sell one of the most expensive homes to ever sell on earth, then I can do this. That's a great story. Thank you for sharing that. And I will share you with something with you too. Don't do the decades thing. Do what Taylor Swift does. Call them eras. So you're now in your, yeah, your my third era. Ryan era. Okay. So in my third era. Because yeah. era sounds cool. And now all the kids are using that on their Instagram and everything like that. So I apologize for dating you earlier and making you seem older than you are. But when I was a kid growing up, brands were McDonald's, Coca-Cola, Pepsi. And now- as I've gotten older, brands are people, which to me as a Gen Xer, it's it's taken a while for me to sort of wrap my brain around it. And now you've written a book all about branding. But before we get to the book, what to you makes a brand? And, and I'm talking about brand when it comes to a person. Brand is just reputation. That's all it is. A clear, consistent, and memorable brand can be attributed to to anyone and anything. So yes, people can be brands. You're a, a brand. Uh, the, the president of the United States is a is a brand it's, because he has a reputation, right? And if you look at if you look at brand math, it's core identity turns into perception the world has of you or of your product turns into reputation once you or the product leaves the room, leaves the chat. And then like a pot of boiling water over time, that turns into brand awareness, right? Which is really then what it is. It's, it's, it's awareness reputation. Um, uh, and so what I wanted to do, you know, I, when I got into sales was, and I looked around, I was like, okay, so how do I, how do I find success here? How do I generate business? How do I generate leads? Because a good brand, a well-known brand generates business. Like you just mentioned a couple, like you think, I don't know, Adidas, you know, Nike. Sure. You're not going there for shoes. You're going there because the brand has made you aware that should you be in the need of anything related to athleticism, go, go there. And, uh, uh, and that's helpful. So in sales for me, I looked around, it's like, all these people are just older. They're more experienced. I don't have any of that. I don't know what to do. Where do I even start? And, and it really started with doing that math saying to myself, okay, how can I create a brand? I don't have to wait because everybody gets a brand eventually. You just either know you have one or you find out by accident that you weren't really in control of yours. And most of the time, that brand is something that you never really wanted to have. Like maybe your brand, like I, I did this exercise actually, and it's an exercise I talk about in the book um, uh, for people to build their personal brands, which is find someone you trust, someone who'll be honest with you and ask them to define you without using your name. What would they say? And I did this with a friend. It was terrible. He's like, you're the tall, prematurely gray-haired guy who thinks he's funnier than he actually is, who looks at the ground while he walks. Like, what? That's not true. I don't do that. And then I noticed, and I was like, wait a minute. I'm a nice guy. I'm not, he's like, yeah, but I don't know. Everyone knows you as the guy who looks at the ground while he walks. Like everybody knows me that way. That's my brand. That's my reputation. It's because when I was a little kid, I had, well, a little kid up until college, I had, I had rash acne, I had really bad skin. And I got so self-conscious, I guess, for 10 years for that era of my life. 
um, when people would look me in the eye and then their eyes would dart around my face. So I'd be self-conscious about it. And, um, and I just got used to looking at the ground. I'd rather look at the ground than make eye contact with people. And I didn't know that that was part of my brand. I didn't realize that was my muscle memory. And so once you understand what your baseline is, then you can start to manufacture strategically your own core identity that you want to put out into the world to become the person that you want to be known for two years from today. Because you can put that plan into action for the next 12 months, and then the work happens with you for the 12 months after that. So that the brand I'm presenting myself as, you know, now, you know, we have a new Netflix show that comes out in the next couple months. You know, when we started filming that, we're like, all right, so I'm going to be a CEO of the greatest real estate firm that's ever lived. All right, we just started the company. That's the brand I'm putting myself out there as, right? That's the brand. I'm going to carry myself that way. I'm going to talk like that. I'm going to put myself out there. I'm going to make sure we do that type of business because when this show airs in two years, which is what it's going to end up being, um, I'm not going to want to be seen as Ryan of yesterday. I'm going to want to be seen as, as myself of tomorrow. And so the strategy there is that core identity turns into consistent content. And consistent content turns into what we call amplification or what I like to say, shouting it from the mountaintop so that success can beget success over and over and over and over. If you follow that brand math and just follow everything that I, that I put into brand it like Sir Hand, anybody can build a personal brand or a product brand. That's so cool. And by the way, I'm, it, I am feeling a bit of a deja vu here because you told the story about walking into that original casting agent saying you were the greatest real estate agent in New York. And now here you are uh, two errors later and you're like the greatest real estate agent on the planet, but you're not there yet. So there is a little deja vu here. Yeah. I got to tell new stories. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So how does the book and the company that you currently uh, built since 2020, how does it all make sense? Because for folks like myself and most of the people out there, you're right. The the real estate guy, you sell big, yeah. big houses. You make a lot of money doing that. How does your, your, your company and your real estate, how does that all work in the world of branding? So uh, great question. Um, I had to build a personal brand so that I could sell those houses for 10 years, right? No one was going to give me a house to sell if they weren't aware of my brand as a great salesperson. So what was my value statement? I go through the book and, and how to create one. Like literally, what is your V factor? What is that value statement that if you had to put it on a website or put it on stationery, you would know exactly what it is. You need to have clarity on who you are as that person, right? Putting yourself out there, whether you're a salesperson of one house or you're a salesperson of all the software in the world or of insurance or whatever, whatever it is that you want. You know, you saying, well, we know you as Ryan, the real estate agent, that's, that's brand awareness, right? You don't know me as that other guy who walks down the street. No, right? There's, there's brand awareness that's then being created. And so then I went through this, the exercise of saying, okay, people know me as Ryan Sirhant, reality TV real estate agent. How do I take that and turn that into a company? I want to build a business. I want other people to work for me now. I don't want to just work for myself. And so in 2020, I built Sirhand, named it after myself. Um, and the book goes into how we kind of formulated everything from the, the logo, the typeface, the coloring, the photography, the ideas, you know, what would be consistent, what would be inconsistent to the PR strategy. There's a whole section of the book just teaching people PR strategy for 2024 and beyond and how you can do all of this without spending a significant amount of money, how you can create consistent content to build brand awareness for yourself or your product without spending a significant amount of money or having a production company to help you. Another cool thing that I did here that I didn't do in my first two books is I, I interviewed a lot of people from... Gary V to Rebecca Minkoff to Kenneth Cole to, you know, to, I just, a lot, there's a big list of people that I, I, I wanted to talk to. And I spent over a year just interviewing these people about what brand awareness meant to them. Like, what is brand? What's good brand? What's bad brand? How did you build your brand? You know, I talked to my, my friend Griffin Thal, who created all the bracelets that I'm wearing, you know, they're Pura Vita bracelets. You see them everywhere. They're, they're, they're kind of one of the first subscription accessory jewelry companies, especially for, you know, young girls. And so clearly I wear a lot of them. Um, and then, he, and then he sold the company for $130 million to Vera Bradley. It was like, okay, how did, how did you 
think about content to community to commerce? How did you do that? Right? What did you go? And so all of his secrets and everybody else's, I, I put into the book to the benefit of everybody who reads it. That's so cool. And did, you know, I, some, I know writers sometimes have predisposed notions of their subject matter. Uh, and you, go, I'm sure you going in, you, you, you have pretty good, pretty good awareness of what branding is. Was there something that you uncovered or discovered while talking to other people or during the process of the book? We're like, oh shit, I didn't even know that. Was, was there one that, that pops out at you? The idea of community. I had never really thought so much about, like, obviously I understand what a community is. I know you got to build community, right? You're building your audience. I get all that stuff, but I had spent so much time thinking about you know, content to commerce. And I'm, I'm a salesperson. I take beautiful photos and beautiful video of real estate. I put it out there and I'm going to sell. Great. The better my content is, the more commerce I'm going to do. Content to commerce. Kylie Jenner does it with makeup. Liquid Death does it with their water. Like there's content to commerce has been around for a thousand years, but it's become easier and easier and easier because of the power of social, et cetera. But then I talked to one person in particular who's great and she's, she's in the book and um, uh, she started a company called August that's all about bringing power back to periods right? for women. Don't make periods this thing that you shy away from. Bring I mean, half the world has them. Bring them back. Let's 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 make it an awesome thing. And so she talked about the most important C being community and how it's community first. You're creating content for your community, and then if they build a no like and trust factor with your brand, only then do you earn the right unlock that final C, which is commerce. And I had never really thought about it that way. Um, and it, it unlocked a lot for me. It, it like unlocked a lot for how we're building our own companies. Like, you know what? I'm going to make some changes right now in terms of how we think about that and how we create that collaborative community. Because especially today, you know, our, our worlds, I think, is more connected than ever before. But at the same time, we're probably all lonelier than we've ever been before. Because you're just all in, you're all in your screens, like the moment you wake up to the moment you go to bed, you know, and that's, it's very, it's, it can be really, really scary. So how do you create a collaborative community in an environment that is slowly but surely separating us using technology, even the Apple Vision Pro, go hang out with your buddy, but now we're going to put another screen over your face in order to do it. Like, you know. I think there's great advances in technology that we're all getting to experience. And it seems like there's new tech and product that comes out every day, which is just wild. Um, but at the same time, nothing's going to replace a human being and our ability to emote and to reason and to want to be around other human beings. And that's a, a key piece of the, the personal branding puzzle. Awesome. All right. Lastly, uh, we've talked about the three eras of Ryan Serhant. What is era four and five? looking like no man um we'll see what happens with the the new the new show see if anyone likes it it's very different it is not million dollar listing it's not selling sunset it is um it's all, it was awesome to work with netflix I'm excited for everybody to see it but it's uh it's it's interesting um it'll it, it, so i don't know we'll, we'll see what happens um i just started this company three years ago so we're baby you know we're just learning to walk right now and so I'm excited to see where this goes and what this starts to look like over the next 10 years. And I mean, eventually I want to build the largest sales platform in the world. And that's the, that's, that's my next era. Sweet. His name is Ryan Serhant. Brand it like Serhant, stand out from the crowd, build your following and earn more money is available now. Ryan, thanks again for the time. Really appreciate it. Thanks, man. You're welcome, Ryan, and that'll do it for this Forbes Books Podcast episode. Don't forget to leave a five-star review on Apple or Spotify and hit subscribe so you don't miss any new episodes. You can always connect with me on X, LinkedIn, and Instagram at Joe Partavilla or TikTok at Jay Partavilla. And please, don't forget the golden rule and treat others as you want to be treated. Thanks for listening. Until next time, adios.